Um, pleasant Sabbath all. Welcome to our decision time revival. We pray that the Holy Spirit's presence will be with us um, this afternoon as we traverse through the Word of God. Exciting times are ahead. Shall you join me in prayer? Uh, Father in heaven, we just want to give you thanks for the privilege that we have this afternoon to be present in your courts. Unworthy though I be, I have come, dear Father, because I know that thou art worthy. As I open your word, may the God of heaven, almighty God himself, speak, and I will remain quiet. May your voice be heard through my voice, and may the will and purpose of God be fulfilled in our lives. Is our action in Jesus' name. A pleasant good afternoon again. It's my pleasure to be here with you one more time as I stand firmly on the word of God and as I seek to look at judged and rewarded. Judged and rewarded. The main text comes from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. And it thus read, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. My mind goes back to Jamaica. My brother's name is Dalton Henry. And I can quite remember at a younger age that Dalton went to a crusade, and upon coming back home that night, he was excited about the prospect of getting baptized. The message that Dalton heard was a message about judgment and how the wicked will be burnt up. He came home, and if there was a, a baptismal pool that was open that night, Dalton would have been baptized. Because in his mind, he, he, he couldn't wait, he couldn't delay, because he thought as much that Jesus was coming by morning light. However, the next day when Dalton got up, and realized that the sun still rose and that everything was okay and that the prophecy about the coming of God was not as short as he thought it would, he recanted. I too thought that I could just live as I like and then at the last minute, then I could just duck and dive in church and enjoy both uh, the best of both worlds. How wrong was I. In Paul's days, there was a city, a place in the city that was called Bema, or judgment seat. It was from this raised um, platform that judgment was announced. Judgment was rendered and condemnation handed out. All public proclamation came from the Bema seat. So we mustn't think that it was only a place of fear and a place of trembling. Certainly, there were some who were rebuked there at Bema, but others were rewarded and blessed. Christ's judgment seat is no different. According to the Bible, there will come a day when Jesus himself will return from heaven and raise those who have died in him and will change those believers in his own image. He will gather those who have been redeemed together and take them home to heaven with him. But also the wicked who have forsaken his call to repentance will be utterly destroyed. We need a reason to live. We need a vision to inspire us, and we need a cause to give ourselves to, our, ourselves to. If we think that we were just born to uh, drink milk and, and then go to nursery 
and then after nursery, we should go to reception school. And then after reception school, we, we make a way to primary school. Uh, uh, and after primary school, to, to secondary school. And after secondary school, we make a way to college. And then after college, we make a way to university, get a degree, you know, probably a, a first or a two-one or the others that are mentioned thereafter. Get a job and buy a house and get married and have kids and save some money and retire and, and get sick and die. I hate to burst your bubble and to be the bearer of bad news. But we are not only here to make a living, we are here to make a difference. My friends, we are here to make disciples of men. Jesus knew that it, the end of time would be difficult. We are here to know Jesus and to make him known. We are serving in the kingdom, but we are not the king. My friends, we are here to preach a word of repentance and by God's grace to get ourselves and others ready for the return of Jesus Christ. We are not only called to preach and teach repentance, but we are also called to point out the judgment of God and the reward for those who accept the offer of salvation. However, some of us have become uh, nonchalant and, and jaded and our soul have become disenchanted and, and cavalier about righteousness and about our purpose on this earth. So let us try and, and dissect 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he had done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Point number one, we will be judged. Judgment is necessary to vindicate divine justice. Point number two, it is Christ who judge. As God the Son, Jesus Christ will be our judge in John 5 and verse 22. That is made clear in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Paul gives us reason why we should aim to please God in everything that we do. He tells us that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, Christ is our savior, but he is also our judge. He will assess our lives and he will pass judgment on the way we live here and now. There will be no plea bargain at this judgment. There will be no question about the authenticity of the information. Jesus knows everything. He knows our actions and he knows our motives. He knows our thought. The judgment will be thorough and the judgment will be fair. Those who have strong motives for doing things uh, that is contrary to what the Bible teaches will find themselves on shaky ground. We have a date in court. I'm here to serve notice on us that we have a date, a court date to attend. Isn't it shocking to know that the one who died for mankind is also the judge of mankind. Point number three, judgment is not an option. We must all appear. Can you imagine? You have a, a, a court appointment in the next 30 days. Where, and for the next 30 days, your actions over that time span will be assessed. You will think every time what you do, what you say, how you act or you react because you want to make sure that after the 30 days and you appear in court that there is a good record that was set. 
Paul also tells us that the basis of this judgment, what the basis of this judgment will be. Each one of us will be judged individually and personally. My friends, and we will be judged by what we have done in this body, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I want to point out that the judgment of God will be universal. The Bible declares we must all, every believer, whether great or whether small, must appear before the judgment seat of God to give an account of the deed that is done in this body. Some think that it will be only preachers and Christian folks who will appear. However, the Bible declared that we must all give an account, Romans 14 and verse 12, so that every one of us will give an account of himself before God. Some of us want to live as we like and die when we can't do better. My friends, in the judgment, some are vindicated and some are condemned. The distinction between good and evil will be quickly drawn in the judgment. There will be reward, but there will also be punishment. There will be no defense to allow the people to get off before the judgment seat of God. Every deed will be exposed and will be accounted for before God. We must understand that God in heaven keeps perfect record based on Matthew 12, verse 36. He sees everything. He hears everything. He knows everything. Hebrew 4 and verse 13. Nothing is hidden from his gaze or from his judgment. Those of us who have done things in secret and we have carefully concealed and hidden it away, the Bible declares that it will be exposed. Luke 12 and verse 3. Profession will, con will count for very little when you say, Lord, Lord, have I not done this? But those will be empty cry. The ability to pray fluently will count for nothing. The eloquence in preaching will count for nothing. Every activity will be laid bare before Almighty God. It will be tested along the plumb line of the Word of God. If we are in line with God's Word, if we are wrapped up and tied up in King Jesus, then there is nothing to fear in the judgment. Galatians 6, 7 to 9 tells us, be not deceived because Paul knew that many would be confused. God is not mocked for whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Jesus is not assessing our work individually. He is assessing it over, it's just not one aspect that Jesus is looking at. He is looking at our entire life. Because if Jesus was looking at just one aspect, I did not have a great start. But by God's grace, I aim to make a definitive finish by the word of God. Some of us started off well, but along the way, we have become bitter. But if we change, if we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, then the blood will make it sufficient. In 1 Corinthians, we are told that the unrighteous, not, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. In Colossians 3 and verse 24, those who do good, will receive an inheritance. There will be sadness and remorse for those who rejected the love of God and the call to salvation. However, there will be overwhelming joy for those who receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
Those who do good will receive eternal life, while those who do evil will face the final judgment. Before God comes, uh, before God calls, we ought to make our calling an election sure. Because there will come a time when the gates of mercy are firmly closed. The Bible declares, today is the acceptable day of salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Isn't it a joy when you go before the courts and when you look inside the courtroom, you recognize that the judge is your friend? We have an advocate, Jesus Christ. We have friends in royal places. We have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on our side. We will be judged not only on what we have done, but on what we refuse to do. When Jesus returns, one group will be rejoicing because they have been vindicated. On the contrary, a much larger group will be terrified because they have missed the opportunity and, to, and because of their aversion towards the word of God and the call to repentance. My friend, sometimes when you go to court, sometimes the innocent is found guilty. And sometimes the guilty walks away free. But in God's courthouse, God's justice will be a righteous justice. The guilty will not be rewarded with life eternal. The innocent, those who have washed their robes and made it white in the blood of the Lamb, will be rewarded. At the judgment, there will be great, a great revelation of character, condition, and sin. Life's secrets will cease. Successful deceptions will end. All veils and disguises will be torn off. The world as well as God will see us as we are. Many of us wants to be saved, but we want to be saved on our own terms. But I have news for you. You have to line up with the word of God. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I was told a story about a dog, a salesman in the USA went into the rural area trying to sell some products and he saw some, some country folks sitting nearby. And while he was there, he recognized that to one side there was a dog that was just moaning and groaning. And it seems as if the people who were talking were not paying the dog any mind. Curiously, the, the, the salesman approached an older man in the group and asked, good sir, uh, what is wrong with the dog? The older man almost nonchalantly replied, the dog is lying on a nail. The salesman asked, then why does he not get up? The old man smiled and said, it is not hurting bad enough for him to get up. Many of us have been lying on different nails of sin. And just because it is not hurting bad enough, we look nice, we talk nice, we sing nice, we preach nice, but their art is still not right. And it is time to get our house in order. John came with a word of repentance and judgment. When we opened the gospel of John, he began preaching repentance and judgment. He came dressed in, in, camel, in camel's hair and with a leather belt round about him. He, he, his breath had honey and locusts. 
But could John preach? He preached a word of judgment. He preached a word of repentance. And the Bible declares that John did no miracle, but he did his bit to build up the kingdom of God. When Jesus came shortly after in Matthew 3 and verse 10, no, I'm sorry, John brought the word that said in Matthew 3 and verse 10, and now the ax is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit will be cut down and cast in the fire. That was the message of John. After that, Jesus came. And Jesus came again with a message of repentance and judgment. In Matthew 4 and verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The prophets, the apostles, throughout the annals of history, preached repentance and pointed to the coming of the Lord. God has set a day in which he will judge this earth in judgment. One thing I am sure of, we have to choose a side that we need to be in. In God's courtroom, it is a courtroom of righteousness. When grace is dispensed, from the vast reservoir of heaven. The unrelenting tap of grace is poured out. Grace is poured out with one objective, to save the sinner. Jesus has not come to destroy us. Jesus said, I have come that he might have life and have it more abundantly. Another thing we have to bear in mind is that grace is not partial, neither is grace bias. Grace doesn't appear to some people and then to others. Sometimes as, as human beings, we can all have our different preferences. But when it comes to the grace of God, um, Titus 2 and verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation ought appear unto all men, teaching us that denying anything that is unlike God and godliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the glory, the blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. The grace of God never turns up without salvation in tow. The grace of God is, is two parts, and salvation are two parts of the same coin. It is like rice and peas, and it's like bun and cheese. It is like horse and carriage. When the grace of God turns up, salvation is not far off. It's not far off. When salvation turns up, salvation has just one purpose, and that is to save the life of the sinner and to call people home to God himself. My friends, I don't know what your story has been, but when the grace of God turns up, its purpose is to bring godly awareness that we must live godly in this present world as we anticipate the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My friends, one of the most difficult stories that I've ever had to read from the Bible is told in a parable. God has been patient with his church. He requires the fruit of repentance from all three in the garden. Jesus told a parable after hearing the news of some people from Galilee who went to church and Pilate had them kill whilst they were worshiping. Luke 13, 1 to 4. He also heard about the, the Tower of Siloam that, that, that fell and killed 18 people. And the bad news seemed to be coming in about what's happening in the world. And Jesus, instead of contemplating what was happening in the world, Jesus said, unless they were not worse sinners than all that are in Jerusalem, but unless, unless you repent, you think you are better than them, unless 
he repent. You think they were worse sinners? Unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. Jesus moved on to speak a parable, one of the most lovely parable in the book, in the book of Luke, Luke 13 and verses 6 to 9. Jesus told the parable of the unproductive uh, fig tree and the need for repentance. Um, listen to the dialogue between the owner of a vineyard and the gardener. Luke 13, verse um, 6 to 9. Speaking of Jesus, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruits thereof and found none. Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumber it, it the ground? And he answered and said that the gardener unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after thou shalt cut it down. The gardener does not tell us what prevented the fig tree from bearing fruit. Figs were supposed to bear uh, fruits uh, in the first year of planting. They were supposed to produce two crops each year in the summer and in the fall. The other plants in the vineyards seem to be productive, but this fig tree was unproductive. God will not allow fruitlessness in his garden. John 15 verse 8, herein is my father glorified that he bears much fruit. Each tree has to bear its own fruit. Tree do not live by legacy. Not what grandfather did, not what my mom did. Each tree will have to bear its own fruit. Tree do not survive by legacy. For three years, the gardener watered the, the fig tree, expecting some return on his investment, but getting nothing. The long-suffering owner looked for return on investment, but kept on getting IOUs. The gardener and the owner deliberated over the destiny of the fig tree. Justice demanded that the tree be cut, up, could be cut down. Justice quoted John 15 and verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, it taketh away. The fig tree was not fulfilling its purpose. Justice demanded that having absorbed um, sunlight and water, having taken up space and the gardener's time, having been protected by, with insecticides and, and fungicides and, and, and pesticides, the least that the fig tree could do is to fulfill its purpose and bear some fruit. God cannot harvest promised fruits. Every year, the tree comes out when it comes for time for auditing, and it is promising that it will be here next year. Harvest is not built on promised fruits. God has watched his church for years and have worn fruitless fig trees to start bearing fruits of righteousness. God has provided for his church. God has protected his people. He has empowered his church. He has fed his church with his word. God has dug around us and lavished grace at our roots. The least we can do is bear some fruits. 
But as he searches the tree of our life, he is still asking the question, where are the fruits? The house of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord. Isaiah 5 and verse 7, the gardener asks the rhetorical question as he examines our life. Isaiah 5 and verse 4, what could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done? God has given us everything we need as it pertains to life and godliness. But yet still, we are still not bearing fruit. God will not tolerate fruitlessness in his garden. Because when God gets ready to count his wealth, he does not count it on the basis of the oil wells in the Middle East. When God gets ready to count his wealth, he does not count the, the gold mines in Africa. When God gets ready to, to count his wealth, he looked past Fort Knox in USA on the gold reserve. Because you see, the earth is still the Lord's and the fullness thereof because he has founded it upon the sea and he has established it upon the floods. Everything we possess belongs to God. When God gets ready to count his wealth, he counts it on the basis of the soul he possess. On the basis of the soul he possess. God will not allow fruitlessness in his church. God has provided grace for us to grow out of our condition. Micah 7 and verse 18. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives transgression? Justice demanded that the fig tree be cut down. But guess what? Mercy said, leave it alone for another year. Grace said, I will help you to grow out of your condition. Like the, the barren fig tree, we are called to face difficult times, but in the midst of our difficulties, the grace of God will sustain us. Because difficulties don't, do not prove the absence of God. You never get as close to God as when you go through trial and temptation and the Son of God comes and, and he walks with me and he talks to me and he tells me, I am his own. My friend, God does not make it so that we avert problems. But in the midst of our problem, God is present. God can still allow good seeds to grow in bad soil. And you can find bad seeds in the best of soil. My friends, the pen of inspiration stated, enfeeble and defective as the church may be, it is the one object on earth on which God bestows his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to change lives and to transform hearts. When people look at the church of God, the church ought to be a place where God demonstrates his power. They should look and see how God works in the life of the believer to turn things around. My friends, in the parable of the unproductive fig tree from Luke um, 13, verses 6 to 9, we are not told what happened to the fig tree after the plea to spare it for yet another year. In a sense, I believe that Jesus wanted us, what Jesus wanted to leave the story open so that we can determine our own ending. What will your ending be? What, how will you end the story of this unproductive fig tree? 
My friends, we will be rewarded if we endure to the end. The Bible declares that it is not how we start the race, but it is how we finish. Matthew 24 and verse 13. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. My friends, there are incorruptible crowns that are waiting for the saints. There will be reward um, the, the faith, for our faithfulness. There will be the incorruptible crown that is 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25. The crown of life will also be up for grabs based on James 1 and verse 12. The person who endures and overcome um, temptation will get a crown of life. There will be a crown of rejoicing for the soul winners based on 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19. A crown of righteousness for those who anticipate and live in the present light of the word of God. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. And then there will be the crown of glory for those who faithfully minister and lead others to the word of God. 1 Peter 5 and verse 4. We, under, we must understand that every deed that is done good in the name of Jesus Christ will be blessed, will be rewarded as long as the motive is right. My friends... There are two types of judgment. We have the investigative judgment and the executive judgment. According to Hebrews 9, verse 27 and 28, the final judgment takes place when one dies and the next event is the second coming of the Lord. Those who are alive at the close of the great controversy will be judged while they are still alive. 1 Peter 4 and verse 5. If the reward is given at the coming of Christ, then the judgment began before his return. God will give to each person according as his work shall be. Romans 2 verses 5 and 6. The last judgment is a judicial process which will include the investigative judgment, um, Daniel 7 and Romans 2 and 5 leading on to 6. There will be the millennium, a thousand years for those who will be resurrected and translated at the second coming of God and the executive judgment, the final judgment for sin. The first thing that we must understand is about the judgment is that the judgment cannot be avoided. We have a divine appointment with our creator. The apostle Paul recorded some details about the final judgment in, in Revelation 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great. So if you are small... <laughs> Or if you are great, they are they st standing before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the book according to their works. My friends, as I said in my opening gambit, some of us want to live life as on our own terms. We want to live as we like and die when we can't do better. In the investigative judgment, our lives are thoroughly examined by God. Our actions, our motive, and our responses to the offer of salvation is laid bare before God. Everything is, is documented. However, if we accept the offer of salvation, if we confess, not only confess, Henry, but you got to repent and not repent for a time. Total turn away from sin. Then when Jesus comes or when he calls, we'll find our names written in the Lamb's book of life. 
Our sins will be covered by the blood of Jesus. Our names will be recorded and kept in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible made it very clear that unbelievers are storing up wrath against themselves. Romans 2 and verse, and verse 5, and that God will give every person a reward based on what their work has been. Romans 2 and verse 6. But there is hope. John in Revelation 20 and verse 6 said, Blessed and holy is he that had part in the, in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So whether Jesus returns in our lifetime or when he, or he allows us to close our eyes in death, a reward is waiting for those who believe and who have kept their commitment true. My friends, that's why Job was able to say confidently that I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand and in the latter days upon the earth though my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh I will see God whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold him and not another Job 19 25 to 27 to the believer in Christ to those who have made their calling an election sure, to those who have repented, to those who have closed the chapter on sin, a reward is waiting. To them, death is only asleep as they await the return of our Lord and Savior. Just ask Lazarus that when the voice of Jesus called, Lazarus rose from the dead, the executive judgment. The wicked, my friends, are storing up, my friends, things that will happen at the end of time. They, the things that can be corrected easily. And I'm not only talking about wicked in the world. Oh, hallelujah. Because you have some wicked in church. Behind the, the guise of religious piety, we can be hard-hearted and difficult. Sins, my friends, that are swept under the carpet, things that we continue to do in the clear light of God's word that we know is wrong, there will come a time. There will come a time. A great reckoning is coming. The doors of mercy still opens wide. The word to us this afternoon is repent. Turn away. Allow God um, to, to, to live his life through you. The wicked who are alive at the time of Jesus' coming will be slain by the brightness of his coming. Those who are righteous and alive will be translated. The righteous dead will be resurrected to meet the Lord in the air. Jeremiah spoke that when the millennium, the thousand years, and the righteous dead who have been risen, and they translated uh, people at the coming of the Lord, and after they have gone off, Jeremiah looked and he saw the state of the earth in Jeremiah 25. And verse 33, and he said, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered or buried. They shall be dung upon the earth. It is a difficult message, but we cannot live comfortable in sin unproductive fig tree. It's time to start bearing fruits of righteousness. Stop promising fruit and put some buds out.
to show that Jesus is working in your life. If Jesus is working in your life, where is the evidence? After a thousand years, the saints return to earth. God will burst the clouds of heaven to execute judgment as the, 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 the praise team sang. For, and I think that was taken from 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away. It's not a quiet event with great noise and the element shall burn with fervent heat. The hurt also and the works therein shall be burned up. You mean, Henry, that lovely house that you have that when you put your foot down, it's lost in the carpet. It's not going to be there. Oh, that job that I put before God, it won't be there. Uh, let's go to Scotia Bank in Jamaica. That little stash that you put away, you mean it won't be there? Lloyd's TSB over here, the little bit that I have there. Henry, you mean it won't be there? Everything that we cherish, all we can take from here is a relationship with Jesus Christ. I have never seen, when, when there is a funeral, you know, I've never seen bank account going. I've never seen houses with how many bathrooms upstairs and downstairs accompanying the owner to Mitcham Cemetery. I have never seen, no matter how loving the couple is, that when one pass on, the other say, bury me right here too. Everything as an end time. And there comes a time, Malachi 4 and verse 1 says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven all the proud, yea, and all they that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and shall leave neither root the devil himself or branches those who follow his leading. But take heart. Take heart, because in Revelation 21, verses 4, verses 2 to 4, John had a message for Croydon. John had a message for our believer. Because when you enter into judgment, and when the judge is your brother, when the judge is your friend, when the judge used to be your advocate, when you enter into court, you enter court with confidence. John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. Have you ever gotten married? And no matter how sweet the lady is, when she turns up, on that day, she looked extra special, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice about time out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall, God in our presence, dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and he shall be their God, and God. For every sorrow, for every sorrow, God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more corona told. No more death, neither sorrow. You know, some of us carry some sorrow in our hearts that we can't even tell people the weight that we carry because they will not understand. No more crying, Henry. Do you cry? Yes, I've lost Brother Heaven. Yes, I have lost my grandmother. I did cry. But the Bible makes it clear that in the earth made new, there will be no more crying, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Not refurbished, Brother Paul. This house was not been refurbished. It was made new. No more pain, Sister Simit, with that bad knee. No more pain, 
No more disappointment. People letting you down. So don't you want to take part in God's retirement plan? Yeah? We are throwing uh, uh, what we call pension all over the place. Pain towards old age. And it is shocking to know that we, we, we lose our health chasing after wealth to put something away in the bank and we go out early in the morning and we work and work and work and work. Do bank shift, the nurses can correlate. Do supply, the teachers can correlate. And do what you need to do and we lose our health. No time to eat properly. No time to rest, Sister Jackie. But and at the end of the day, we, we finish paying for the mortgage only when we relax now to retire we realize that we are not well and we'll have to sell the house that we work so hard for to pay for our care in the, in the, in the nursing home. It seems as if it is a catch-22. But if you are able to honestly declare like Paul that I have fought a good fight, 2 Timothy 4, uh, verses 7 and 8, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, hallelujah, the righteous judge shall give on that day and not for me only but for all those who love his appearing. That's why we come to church. We, 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 are not, we are not bounded to come to church. We come to church because we love God. We, we provide services because we love the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are not doing it for the reward. It is a love relationship. That's why we, we, we participate in various activities, singing and reaching out to the public. Not that we are storing up good deeds, but it's because of the loving relationship. My friends, a lady, she had a husband and he had a long list of things that needed to be done. And every day he would present the woman with the list of things that needed to be done. And the woman hated that list. And whether by accident or design, the man passed on. And the woman eventually married a good man. You know, a man like Henry. <laughs> he married, she married a good man who loved her, who was the provider and the protector for his family. A man who would tell her regularly how much he loves her, not only talk, but he will shout. And she found herself doing things for this man that she w w would never normally do for her husband. And one day while she was going through the house ravaging, she found the list that the previous husband left. And as she went through, she realized that she was doing for the new husband far above that which was on the list. Because it's a love relationship. And when you love somebody, you find yourself doing things that you are not compounded to do. But if you love Jesus, you will do what he calls you to do. Not because of the reward, but because of the loving relationship. God's retirement plan as I close. Then, if we are faithful to the end... We are prepared for God's retirement plan. We will trade our love, service, and fidelity and covenant to God through sacrifice to become partakers of God's retirement plan. It is a plan like no other. At the coming of Christ, the faithful followers of God will now be celebrities. There used, to be in, there used to be in last in everything. You know, giving, you, go, you my friend, no, you my friend, go ahead my friend, giving service. But this time around, when Jesus returns, there will be celebrities and Jesus has come to get them out of here. 
out of the sin-cursed earth. They used to be in last, but this time the dead in Christ shall be rise first. God will turn up for his children personally. For God himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Death has lost its power over them. Uh, big enough, O oh, death, it says, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The Lord has called. I have taken out a retirement policy with King Jesus. This light affliction as I close in two minutes, while I labor for him here, is just for a while. Jesus has prayed my premium in full with his blood. This insurance policy will not become void at death. This insurance policy will last for eternity. Jesus has booked my flight and paid for my accommodation in my father's house. Our retirement from this world of sin will begin with 1,000 year ear bubble vacation in the first instant and life everlasting thereafter. We will trade in this old body for new ones. We will not age. There will be no hunger. Nobody will be thirsty over there. No traffic jam. No need for the light of the sun. No need for radiator to provide heat. No need for light bulb. There will be no disaster. No sickness. No hospitals. No graveyard for the lamb that in the midst of them shall feed them. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. My friend, it all began with a tree in the Garden of Eden, the tree on which the fruit of, the, of good and evil hung. Satan deceived Eve from this tree. Sin was corrected and redemption purchased on a tree the cross of Calvary. If we are faithful to the end, we will eat from the tree of life. Blessed are they that do his commandment, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Closing, as I've said three times now, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today, is decision time. The revival has started. This afternoon, Pastor Royston will be here with another message that speaks to decision time. So we are inviting you to tune in later at about UK time, 5.30 p.m. or Eastern T Standard Time, 12.30 p.m or Eastern Caribbean and Jamaican time, um, 11.30 a.m. for another message from the Word of God. The constant message has been, repent, prepare to meet our Savior in peace. It's a love relationship. Amen. Oh, shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you, dear Father, for the word that you have given us this afternoon, a word, dear Father, that challenges us to recognize that we will be judged, but there is no fear because the judge is our friend and our king. Recognize, dear Father, that what we do while we're alive matters, and that there will come a time, dear Father, when everyone will have to give an account for the deeds done in this body. Recognize we cannot hide from you, dear Father. We know, dear Father, that this afternoon there is somebody who has listened to this word and this message has resonated with you. Do not ignore the call of the Holy Spirit. Today is the acceptable day of salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. There is still room in the kingdom of God 
for one more sinner who can be saved by grace. So until then, dear Father, keep us faithful. Keep us strong. Sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And let the church say, Amen and Amen. God is good all the time.